All right, welcome back to the History of the Papacy podcast. Today we have a really exciting interview with um, somebody you'll probably be very familiar with, Professor Scott Rank of the History Unplugged podcast. How are you doing today, Scott? Doing all right, Steve. Thanks for having me back on. Uh, we're currently both, um, we're many feet apart right now. If you're listening during the uh, big COVID-19 uh, lockdown of 2020, uh, but I guess when we record these, we're never in the same room anyway, so it doesn't yeah, really true. matter. <laughs> Today, we're talking about a really fascinating topic of insane rulers, and insanity is definitely, um, there's been plenty of rulers who've been insane or at least made insane uh, policies and actions throughout their reigns, and we're joined today by Professor Scott Rank of the History Unplugged podcast, who's also, in addition to being a podcaster, he's the author of numerous books, but uh, lately he's written a book called Nine Insane Rulers, which is either released or will be soon to be released, depending on when you listen to this. And we're going to talk a little bit about some of the historical leaders and um, some of the crazy and demented things they have uh, been known to do. Uh, he, like I said, he's the host of the History Unplugged podcast. And if you listen to his podcast or Beyond the Big Screen, you know that we did a, a short series called Hollywood Hates History. And we talked about some of the most um, outrageously good and bad history movies. One thing that I just, I had to bring up because I've been thinking about it ever since I saw it. There's a show on now on the Smithsonian channel called Weapons Masters. And I know this this little uh, segment of it's gonna really get under Scott's skin. It's where the, um, the weapon master, Mike Load said how effective and awesome fire arrows are. I think a duel might be in order over that one. Maybe a duel with fire arrows. <laughs> yeah, I don't know why, but that was the thing that kept coming up in every single movie we did. You, Why have an arrow when it's on fire? Because that doesn't affect how you shoot it. I mean, wind resistance, all that, that has nothing to do with archery. It's how hot it is. That, that makes it how good your archers are. So why have an arrow when you can have it on fire? That's what yeah. we saw. A beautiful fire arrow. There's nothing, there's nothing. I mean, it's cinematic. I don't know how effective that is on the battlefield, though. Yeah, lighting on fire. It's great to light things when you're writing your cannons and other things. There's going to be no problem all. Just let it blaze. Just do it. Just do it. <laughs> So, Scott, tell us a little bit about yourself. Like I said, I think everybody's um, probably at least familiar with you and your work, but also tell us a little bit about this upcoming book you're doing or you have coming out soon. Yeah, so I have a podcast, like you said, and I was in the academic world, but history is miserable and boring the way it's taught there. So I like the idea of the classical humanities idea of history that you're trying to help people understand the human experience. And I don't think history is about deconstruction and problematizing the way it's taught in universities, but how can we understand what we're living through, through good and through bad? And uh, that's what got me on the topic of this particular book, because uh, a few years ago I was reading articles where mental health professionals were diagnosing Donald Trump with narcissistic personality disorder. And I'm not going to argue whether he does or doesn't because I want to mention the contemporary political relevance and then quickly move away from it and get away. Um, but in the 2020 election, I think mental health is going to be an issue like never before, where people on the left might say Donald Trump has narcissistic personality disorder or other mental afflictions. People on the right might say Joe Biden has early onset dementia. But in all these discussions, people were saying that we have more mentally ill or dare I say insane rulers at any time in history. You have populists in America, but also in Brazil, in the Philippines and elsewhere. But if you actually look at history, truly insane rulers of the past are in a completely different galaxy from anyone we have today, with the exception of someone like Kim Jong-un. I'd like to reframe it, reframe it and ask, if Joe Exotic from Tiger King were your president, what would it be like to be ruled by Joe Exotic? What if Joe Exotic were your emperor? What if he had complete and total power? Um, have you seen uh, the documentary? I guess I should ask that at first, uh, Tiger King. No, I haven't seen okay. it. 
very long story short, you can't imagine these people are real. It's a group of people who own private tiger zoos in the United States. And when my wife and I were watching it multiple times, we looked at each other and thought this can't be real, which I thought was useful because when I read accounts of some of the people in this book, it seems like they can't be real, but they were real. So just one short example is um, Akbar Turkmenbashi, the leader of Turkmenistan from the 90s to 2006, who had an 80 foot tall golden statue of himself that always rotated to face the sun. He renamed days of the week after himself and his deceased mother and also an asteroid after himself too. Anything just bizarre you could possibly imagine he did. He had his own brand of vodka that he released. Uh, Emperor Caligula, he, according to one account, made his horse a senator and appointed a number of servants. Ottoman Sultan Ibrahim I wanted his palace decorated from ceiling to floor in expensive furs, and he practiced archery on his palace subjects. So the point of the book is basically to look at what would it actually be like to be ruled by somebody like that? How did people rule in spite of the fact that they had almost no cognitive ability, their mental faculties were very weak? And I think also to give some context that I get it. We live in strange times in the 21st century with social media. We see sides of our politicians that we haven't seen before and maybe would have never wanted to see before. And I get it. They're eccentric. But I argue that compared to the past, it was completely worse and much different. There's a, a lot of layers to the, I guess, the technical aspect of this. It's hard enough for someone to, for a, a psychologist or a psychiatrist to uh, identify if somebody's mentally ill you know, in person, and then it's almost impossible for them to do it from, say, like a screen or watching someone. How do historians and um, mental health people look into people in the past and make kind of, you know, they're not going to be able to diagnose a person, but how do they maybe think about if somebody is was mentally ill or not? based on primary sources and things, and maybe even a dearth of primary sources, and even based on secondary sources? Yeah, good question. And it even sounds a little bit gauche to say history's most insane rulers, because for those who do suffer with mental illness, I think it's important to make that separation. But then there's a legal definition of insanity that I do think does fit the people here. Um, and yeah, what you said, first of all, if we're talking about madness, the way that some historians use the term, because that's how it was used historically, a problem is, is that um, whether historical or clinical, there's no universally accepted definition. Uh, using the term insanity, madness, in the past, it covered a whole spectrum of disorders of everything from agoraphobia to the condition formerly known as multiple personality disorder. In ancient times, uh, people would diagnose it as a spiritual affliction, some sort of demonic possession. With the examinations of medicine through ancient Greeks and then Romans like Galen, they would talk about the four humors and how the humors might be out of proper proportion, and that could lead to it. So they're looking more into biology. Then um, in the era of Christendom, you have ideas like the holy fool, where Russians would have the idea that those who are mad have some sort of special enlightenment that the rest of us don't have. And then you get into deconstructionism in the 20th century. Historians like Michel Foucault would say that uh, madness is a social construction. Different societies interpret madness in different ways according to the norms and practices of their society. So if I were making this book a doctoral dissertation, the title would have to be something like an examination into the social constructions of mental illness through the period of the reign of Charles VI from the age of the Hundred Years' War, yada, 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 yada. But come on. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's no fun. And yeah. <laughs> sometimes insanity, it's sort of like the Supreme Court justice's definition of pornography. I can't define it, but I know it when I see it. Um, we think, come on. I mean, yes, I get it that different societies have different definitions of what is acceptable and unacceptable behavior. But our legal system would at least understand where they have a definition of insanity that is intended to be universal. And that's regarding a defendant's um, mental illnesses of such a severe nature that a person cannot distinguish fantasy from reality, cannot conduct 
his or her affairs due to psychosis or is subject to uncontrollable impulsive behavior. Um, so that's a definition I'm trying to work with. And then to get to your other question about how do we diagnose someone? Yeah, that's a problem because um, since the 1960s, psychiatrists have had something called the Goldwater Rule, uh, where after the presidential campaign of Barry Goldwater, where some said that he had mental illness and he was diagnosed from afar as having mental illness, the profession decided that you cannot diagnose someone that you have not had personal contact with. Well, historians basically have to violate that because we can't talk to the person. Uh, so the way they get around it, traditionally they would use documentation and make theories. And this is tricky. So for example, taking the case of Emperor Caligula, the first person in my book, he's been diagnosed with everything from schizophrenia to psychopathy to epilepsy, bipolar disorder, or just a garden variety megalomaniac. Um, but the problem is, is that you have to be careful with your sources because our traditional sources of Caligula, those who were written in his lifetime, like Philo of Alexandria and Seneca the Younger, are pretty straightforward. But the stuff that's the most outlandish and the craziest and the basis for the horrible 1970s movie Caligula, which I have not seen, um, is by Suetonius, who's written almost 200 years after his death. Um, so maybe he's letting his imagination get to him. Maybe he's relying on fourth or fifth hand evidence. Maybe he's listening to political hatchet men who didn't like Caligula. Maybe Caligula is a scapegoat for problems that the Roman Empire have. Um, so sources are one. These traditional sources are how most people do it. But recently, there have been more advanced sources. So, for example, with George III, uh, there was a study a couple of years ago where researchers used machine learning and AI to examine George III's writings. And based on aberrant trends in his writing that it could diagnose, okay, he's having a manic spell here and here and here based on his writing. Or there's forensic techniques like George III's hair was discovered and they found he had 300 level times a normal amount of arsenic in the system because his physicians may have been giving him that to him thinking it would have helped him, but it didn't. So all sorts of ways to examine if someone is insane or not. None of them are perfect, but we do what we can. So that really is your challenge and the scholar's challenge is that you have to spend a lot of time in the historiography, who's writing it. If it's somebody who's an enemy, you've got to weight that in a certain way. If it was somebody who wrote a few hundred years later, who was maybe leaning towards being positive or negative, that all has to be weighted as well. Yeah, exactly. So uh, another example with Ibrahim the first of the Ottoman Empire who practiced archery on his um, subjects. He loved large women and ordered his subjects to find the largest in the empire so she could join his harem. And they found someone who weighed about 400 pounds, which is very large. Uh, but one historian argues that, well, Ibrahim, um, he was a victim of all sorts of different palace coups and court intrigues going on. And at this period of the Ottoman Empire, you practically expected to get killed um, in a regicide. You grew up in the palace. You weren't let out because your brother didn't want you to roam freely because um, a brother could be could rival you to the throne and claim it. And if he were able to marshal enough resources, he could do so. So you were left under lock and key in the palace. He expects to be executed his entire life. He's finally given the sultanship in his 20s when he's never been outside the Istanbul Palace before lives it up like crazy for about 10 years, and then he himself is killed. Now, some historians wonder if after he was killed, chroniclers sort of wanted to clean things up and not make it look like a lot of dirty backhanded dealings and palace coups and court intrigues that led to his execution. But he was such a terrible person that he brought it upon itself and we couldn't help it. We just had to get rid of him. So those are things that we have to deal with. Um, and the way I'm trying to eat my cake and have it too is mention the problems in the historiography, but then also tell those stories because, come on, they're fun. Yeah, I think there's probably another layer to that, too, is that, like you were saying, with um, in the Ottoman court or any number of other situations where something that's cultural might not seem so great to us today or, you know, even borderline crazy of uh, an action to take that in their time and in their place was a completely rational thing to do. 
Yeah, I think uh, somebody who could fit that the best is Ivan the Terrible, called Ivan the Great by Russians, where on the one hand, he butchered and tortured tens of thousands of people within the Russian Empire. He completely devastates and destroys Novgorod because he suspects it of forming an alliance with a rival state. He tortures, he mutilates, he throws, sews up people in bearskin rugs and throws them to rivers. Um, and again, I mean, there's questions on accounts we're using on how accurate those different stories are. But then also with the context of the times, like you said, this is in the 16th century. This is only about two or 300 years after Genghis Khan kills tens of millions of people. So many people are killed that global CO2 levels plummet because farmers are killed and their farmland returns to forest. What Ivan is trying to do is secure his borders against daughter states of the Mongol Empire. And throughout his reign, there are Tatar and Mongolic groups who ride into different cities in Russia, capture thousands of people, men are killed, women and children are taken into the slave trade and sold on slave markets in Central Asia. So he has to do whatever he can in order to secure his borders against that. And that might mean political purges against rival factions. So not defending Ivan, not saying he's great, but very different times. I think Ivan was probably the trickiest one in your whole book because there were some things that you could write off as cultural or extreme but necessary, like, you know, taking out Novgorod in the way he did, that there was a lot of other things that if he was, if he took the soft approach, he could have had his whole kingdom steamrolled. But then didn't he um, rageaholic kill his son? Uh, yeah, he did. He also, um, thinking of other stories, he had, I think, four or five wives total and was a bigamist at different places as he was cycling in and out of his wives. Some think that he um, tortured animals when he was young and throw cats off of high ramparts in a different fortress in Moscow. And then like some of the more salacious stories are that he forced uh, a group of maidens to travel with him that he deflowered. That doesn't sound very real. So that sounds probably like a German merchant who's traveling through uh, Russia and writing that. Um, but yeah, it's, um, it's, it's tricky in the times to, on some level you account for them, but then at what level do they go even beyond the norms of their time? And we can say that this is not a healthy person. And if we're to believe most of the accounts of Ivan and his cruelty, how people are just tortured constantly. And this goes beyond, a fear tactic like the firebombing of Tokyo in World War II and into um, being a, somebody who just delights at other people's pain. Also, there's probably another, even another factor with some of the rulers that you've done research in, what um, impacted possibly drugs or alcohol have? I'm sure that um, somebody like Ivan the, uh, the Terrible or the Great, depending on your perspective, probably had a, a tipple or two of drink in his life. Do, is there any evidence for some of these rulers that uh, substance abuse may have uh, impacted the things that they did that would be questionable? Uh, there's a few that were heavy drinkers. So the president of Turkmen uh, Turkmenistan, Akbar Turkmenbashi, the guy with the gigantic statue, he was widely suspected to be a heavy drinker. Um, but something interesting uh, that wasn't a common factor of drugs and alcohol, uh, but something that was theorized a lot by basically everyone from the 1500s onward was syphilis. So it comes from the new world, so you're not going to get it in the ancient world. But Ludwig of Bavaria was suspected of having it, and that caused a uh, degenerative breakdown. Idi Amin, when he was uh, part of the colonial British forces around Uganda, a medical examiner thought he had it as well. Uh, so if you have access to a lot of women, you're not a very scrupulous person. That's something that can happen a lot. Uh, so syphilis is all over the place. It's, a, it's one of the great, I don't know if I call it an unsung hero, but it moves a lot of things through history. British men were, are suspected of wearing powdered wigs due to possibly the effects of syphilis causing baldness. And uh, this is something that I saw a lot. So drugs and alcohol, surprisingly not as prevalent as you would think it would appear in a story like this. Now, uh, you picked nine rulers. What made you pick this top nine? What, 
how did you um, decide to, that some would make the cut, but other ones um, not quite so much? Because that's obviously a, a complicated, I mean, you could probably have picked a hundred rulers if you wanted to. Right. I, um, I'm probably biased by different sources. So if we simply know more about this person or that person, then that would influence me in one direction or the other. And you could argue different criteria and have different people, but I wanted to choose uh, different types of criteria for insanity to have different types of rulers, because if they're always sociopaths who torture people, that gets pretty depressing pretty fast after a while. But that is part of it. Uh, so I chose a few different criteria. One was uh, disassociation from reality. Uh, so one person who fits that is uh, Charles VI of France, who is the father of the king who is involved during the period of Joan of, Joan of Arc. But Charles VI is king during the Hundred Years' War. He thought that he was made of glass and could shatter at any moment, which the glass delusion, as it was called, was a pretty common affliction in the Renaissance area up into uh, the 16 or 1700s, and due to various reasons, uh, no longer exists. Uh, Ottoman Sultan Ibrahim, he, I think, fits disassociation, wanted to decorate his palace ceiling to floor and fur because he thought it meant something that it was like something out of a legend or uh, Ludwig of Bavaria. He is, I think the nicest person in my book, maybe an unsung hero. Almost. He wanted to build all these uh, fairy tale castles throughout Bavaria in the 1800s, even though castles are completely uses useless as a defensive fortification in this time period. Um, the second criteria is something that you could call them a sociopath, possibly even a psychopath like Ivan the terrible who raped, uh, tortured and murdered his subjects or, uh, Kim Jong il that for without trying to speak in hyperbole turned North Korea into something out of 1984 with the police surveillance state. Um, and then a third criteria is, uh, megalomania or na narcissistic personality disorder. This is something that seems to be self inflicted and when people are in power, once we get into a very long period, getting into the decades, this just becomes uh, worse and worse. So Turkmen Bashi, who has the rotating statue of himself, did not happen at the beginning of his reign, happened at the end. Uh, Caligula essentially referring to himself as a god and wanting to be worshipped as such and develop a religious cult around his sister too. Uh, Kim Jong-il requiring his portrait to be in every North Korean home along that of his father and claiming that he shot he, the first time he golfed he sank 18 holes in one um i mean which you and i would never say that i hope we would never say it because we know that sounds ridiculous and we know that people mm -hmm. would laugh at us and they should laugh at us because it's ridiculous but they didn't think it was ridiculous when they said that because they had fed into their own ego for so many decades that, that seemed entirely plausible in their minds plus they liquidated people around them that would question them saying that so you can get away with saying stuff like that in that context in your book, there's a there's a pretty representative sample between different eras of time, starting at Caligula and going into the modern time. Uh, there weren't, there wasn't anybody before Caligula, and there's kind of a gap in the, sort of the Middle Ages. Was there a reason why maybe some of the pre uh, pre uh, Caligula ancient people didn't, a leader didn't make the cut and maybe somebody in the middle ages didn't make the cut. Yeah, I think it, it's a difficult thing and it's a question of sourcing. So the person who was the most notorious of having madness was probably Nebuchadnezzar in the old Testament account where in the book of Daniel, where he goes mad for seven years. Um, it's tricky because in ancient Mesopotamian cultures, you really don't have a lot of sources to look at something beyond an official court chronicle. And um, that makes it more difficult to determine what's going on. In the Middle Age period, if we're looking at Western Rome, after the fall of the Western Roman Empire, up until the High Middle Ages, again, there's not a lot of sources available. Um, but the place that does produce the most are the Byzantine Empire and also the Middle East. And just somebody who I thought could fit the definition was Al-Hakim bi Amir Allah, he was the caliph of the Fatimid Empire in Egypt, and he was responsible for destroying the Holy Sepulcher in Jerusalem in 1009, which would be like somebody destroying Mecca and the pilgrimage sites today. 
And that's something that probably more than anything else kicks off the Crusades 90 years later. Um, so he did all sorts of crazy things. He persecuted Jews and Christians. He destroyed churches. He killed dogs until none were left in alleyways because he thought they were unclean. He forbid beer and wine. Uh, he also forbade the selling of, he limited the selling of raisins for fear that they could be uh, turned into wine. So you couldn't sell more than five pounds at a time. And the dried fruit industry completely is destroyed. Uh, women were no longer allowed to access public spaces or show their faces publicly. So he was a religious fanatic in that time period. And that could be an example of someone who could make the cut. Was there anybody else who um, possibly would have made the cut? Nebuchadnezzar, that's a good one. I could see how he might not quite make the cut. And um, also the one you just mentioned, was there anybody else who was close? Well, there's a lot of other people. There's a couple of Byzantine emperors. They escape my mind right now. Um, Selim II of the Ottoman Empire is somebody who also had to be ruled by regents. Um, so there's a lot of people, but I think what makes them not stand out is for the most part in the age of dynasties, when you want your son to be on the throne, no matter what, even if they're not mentally well, even if they're completely incapable of ruling, even if they're eight years old, you'll just surround them with regents and the rule in your stead, but your dynasty falls apart if you don't have someone from your bloodline to go on. So that is something that incentivizes you. And that's how we can have, insane rulers in the pre-modern era and why we see so many of them. But the reason they don't stick out as much is because kingdoms typically knew how to dealt with someone who either wasn't effective as a king or wasn't mentally up to the task. And there would be regents appointed in their stead. There's a phrase in Latin, I forget its name, but in the 12 and 1300s, church canon law came out with a term to be able to remove a bishop from his position because he wasn't mentally capable. This was later applied to Kings as well. And I think uh, some competitors of Charles VI wanted to get him kicked out of the throne through this. Um, so it's kind of a tricky overlap for people who would be worth looking at their lives and people I looked about uh, for this book is that they're not mentally well, they're insane, but they have just enough cognitive ability to wield power and cause trouble. So that Venn diagram doesn't overlap very much, but it does. That must have been a very interesting thing throughout history because you could have a ruler who, especially if they're a part of a dynasty, who maybe they are actually you know, mentally uh, disabled or men mentally ill. They could be cognitively impaired or... Um, regents and administrators could just say, well, they are, even if they aren't, so that they could get them removed. I mean, that must have played out many times over the course of time. Yeah. And the very systems that set up power structures in the past could have caused mental illness uh, in these rulers. Uh, like with the idea in ancient Egypt that brothers and sisters would marry each other in order not to contaminate the royal bloodline, well, everyone is inbred and they can barely walk. In a similar kind of way, Ludwig II of Bavaria, who builds these fairy tale castles, he had a very lonely, very isolated childhood. He had tutors who would come in and train him, but he almost had no playmates his own age with a similar idea that with a royal upbringing, you're not so-called contaminated by being around people around you. So he had a vivid, wild imagination. And when he was an adult, he would have dinners where there were three or four places set for guests, but nobody came. It was only him there. And he would have imaginary conversations with Mary Antoinette and Louis the 14th and the court of Versailles. Um, and another example of the, the power structure causing harm to people, uh, the Ottoman empire just, I think wins the award from this. So the challenge of the early Ottoman empire is the sultanship didn't automatically go to the oldest son. It went to any son. So for the first hundred years, Every time a sultan died and a son was going to step in his place, there would be a massive civil war that would cause devastation because different sons are trying to get military officers and factions together. They fight wars and then the winner wins. Uh, a solution later was that a the son who claimed power would have all of his brothers and their sons strangled. So you would have dozens and dozens of people strangled. The public didn't like this. So the final solution was that you would keep your brothers imprisoned. 
sometimes you would be born in captivity. Uh, it was called the Gilded Cage. So you would be in a section of the royal palace and you would have your own room. You would get receive instruction, but your world was basically a few rooms. And that's not good for cognitive mental health. Uh, so with Ibrahim the first in the book, his older brother was murdered. He expected to be murdered any day. He rules for 10 years. He um, manages to hold power mostly because he terrorizes people and he is pretty good at executing rival factions. That's one thing that he's pretty good at. Um, but he drains the resources of the Ottoman Empire. He gives massive gifts, gifts to the women in his harem. He leads the Ottoman Empire into a disastrous war with Venice. Um, Istanbul is blockaded, so it's running out of resources. People are starving. He lives the whole let them eat cake lifestyle. People hate him, and that ultimately leads to his deposition. But he was sort of a victim of how the ruling system was set up. So we don't have people like that today, uh, but we do have megalomaniacs, thanks to mass media and other stuff. Now, this one might be tough. Be um, you might have to take your objective historian hat off for this one. But like maybe somebody like Vlad the Impaler, who is he mentally ill or is he just evil or is he just doing practical things? I mean, that's probably another one where it depends on the situation. But um, if you listen or if you believe some of the stories told by those German um travelers and merchants they they were uh very um when they went from town to town they had a lot of um uh they always seemed to get off of a high horse when they were there what um can do people well like i said you might have to be less than objective on you know a historian but is there a line between being just um mentally ill to being maybe just a bad guy bad personality Right. And I think that um, mental illness does not make you a bad person by no means. I mean, there's plenty of people who have struggled with it and overcome it. And in fact, some of the greatest leaders in history had mental illness problems. Uh, there's a wonderful book by Joshua Shank called Lincoln's Melancholy that gets into Lincoln's problems. He was described as being melancholy at the time. We would call it di depression, um, suicidal tendencies. But the whole point of the book is that he was able to lead the United States through the worst period in its entire history, not in spite of his mental health issues, but because of them, because mm -hmm. he had dealt with his own internal darkness. He wasn't phased when uh, the rest of the world was turning dark. And Winston Churchill battled depression. I think uh, Martin Luther King Jr. attempted suicide. So it's not that issue um, there that mental health would disqualify someone. It's more that I think it perhaps reveals character. So if you have bad tendencies, then you can't keep them in check in the same way. If you have good tendencies, then uh, they'll still shine through. So one thing with uh, George III is uh, eight, an aide of him compliment him saying that in the depths of his worst babbling delusions, he never uttered a foul word. And um, some positive things that came about as a result of his mental illness is that he was a huge patron of Baroque music. He would play Handel when he was battling with episodes. So huge patron of the arts in that way. John Adams complimented him on his enormous library. Uh, Ludwig II, he may have risked bankrupting Bavaria with his castles, but if you go to Southern Germany, the basically the entire section in your Let's Go Germany book or your Frommer's Guide or whatever are the castles of Ludwig. He wanted to patronize the arts and turn Bavaria from a backwater province to the cultural, the supreme cultural place within Germany. I mean, arguably he succeeded because everyone thinks that Germans wear Lederhosen and Dirndls, but they don't. Like Germans hate it when you say that because they say, no, that's only Bavaria where they do that. Like that's <laughs> basically assuming that every American wears a 10 ga gallon hat and um, the, what do they call those? Bolo ties? That's Bolo, it. Yeah. Yeah. If you meet someone outside the United States, like, no, that's Texas. So he succeeded. It is it tricky as a historian and, um, and maybe, uh, so, I mean, I have seen some in history books that I've read that they maybe tried to ascribe too much to, uh, the actions a leader takes from either mental illness or physical illness. I, um, have read things about Alfred the Great that, oh, he did X, Y, and Z when he was having a flare up of, uh, 
uh, diagnosis of the historian gave them that he had irritable bowel syndrome and that's why he did X, Y, and Z. Or there's, you know, other examples where they say, you know, like I said, mental or even physical illness. Is that a, um, do you, have you seen that? And if so, do you think that's a thing that the historian has to take into consideration? Causality of uh, that sort of case. You're asking if the mental illness would have caused them to do that or if it. Yeah. Or, and if, you know, looking at it from the, you know, from our 2020 perspective, can we place too much causation on those characteristics and those, you know, if they possibly did have an illness and to the actions that they take? Right. I think it, it's always good to treat it with some suspicion because it's almost too clean of an explanation. He did this because he was mad, not, well, he did this action that he thought was reasonable at the time, but due to the chaos theory of how history works, it didn't work for whatever reason. Or he did this because of some ulterior motive. He um, maybe wanted to lose this particular battle for some reason. Um, just to say that, well, he was insane because of this reason is a very neat and clean explanation. Um, to give you an example of something that just sounds bizarre is uh, with Caligula early in his reign to prove his greatness. He wanted to uh, reenact when King Darius in one of the Greek Persian wars crossed the Hellespont, this waterway that separates Asia Minor from Greece. So he linked a bunch of ships together over the Hellespont and troops were able to cross that way. Uh, one story by, I think it's Suetonius and Dio about Caligula say is that Caligula said, I will beat him and let, at this gulf where there's a three mile wide uh, waterway, he set up a number of ships, he covered it with dirt, and he rode on his horse back and forth for like 48 hours um, to show his greatness. And there's a lot of stories like that, that when you're imagining Caligula doing these things, he sounds like the kid in that Twilight Zone episode who yeah. has incredible mental powers and basically tortures everyone around him. And he's impulsive and erratic. And he just moves from craziness to craziness to craziness to craziness. And that's how Caligula, that's what he looks like in the sources. Just he does that. And then he leads his soldiers to the channel of England and to, to, to wage an assault on England and conquer it. And then he tells them to pick up seashells on the shore and says, this is your bounty. And then leads them back to Rome and has a huge victory parade. And then he tortures and executes people. And your mind can't even comprehend all of it. Um, so that's something that, when there are stories like that that seem a little bit suspect, something that historians come back to a lot is if it's written 200 years after the fact, sometimes it could be the chronicler commenting on contemporary issues, but they're inserting contemporary characters into characters of the past. So Caligula could be a sock puppet for this current Roman senator that the chronicler doesn't like. And he's making the point that Caligula did this, 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 and this. Look how horrible he is. Uh, who could he be like, I wonder? Um, or just, he's mm -hmm. making it very clear that it's this person. So that could be an issue. Well, I um, I read the book and I it was just wonderfully written. It was, it does not read like a dry history book. It's, um, it, it has a very nice narrative flow. Uh, I would definitely highly suggest people go out and get it. How can people get the book if they are interested in it? Yeah, any seller, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, whatever third-party platform you look for books. Uh, if you go to historyunpluggedpodcast.com uh, or historyonthenet.com, then you'll see it there as well. Uh, you've, like I um, said or previously, we've worked on a project together. Do you have any other uh, big series you have in the plans that you might uh, plug or even give us a heads up on? Uh, so I hope that we can do some more episodes of Hollywood Hates History because there's an, there's a lot more John Wayne movies out there that <laughs> we have to look off into the distance and start monologuing. And um, uh, so hopefully we'll kick that back up and in the summer i'm going to start with uh co-host james early we've done a number of uh military histories one on the revolutionary war one on the civil war and we're going to be checking out world war one oh that'll be it uh exciting that's a huge topic yes it is but you've got a lot to buy uh, you've tackled a couple big ones in the past uh projects so i think this one's uh a natural extension 
yeah, it's um, it, it's closer to the modern era, so I think it'll maybe be more relatable than um, some of those earlier battles. Well, I want to thank you so much for coming on, and um, there'll be links to the uh, where you can find your podcast and your books in the show notes, and uh, you know all the best. And we definitely do have to fire up Hollywood hates history again. So much hatred of history in Hollywood. Yeah, we have to light up our arrows and shoot them at our targets. Yeah. <laughs> All right, great. Talk to you next time. Absolutely.